Hook. He currently works at Google working on Chrome OS. Before that, he worked for Canonical as the security team's tech lead. He's a Debian developer and a big advocate of free software. Um, today, he's going to be talking about how to use open source software and hardware to increase the security of your projects. Roughly speaking. Um, can everyone hear me? Sounds like it. OK, cool. I'll just shout a little bit. Um, anyway, uh, since I'm mostly a coder and not a professional speaker, I'm going to try to distract you from that by filling my slides with cats. So um, hopefully that will stay entertaining. Um, if you want to fetch these slides, uh, they're at that URL. Uh, and I always, I started adding this to my slides that my name is pronounced Case, C-A-S-E. Um, it's a Dutch spelling, so I blame this on my grandparents. Um, but that's what I've got. Um, so I, I chose the name of this uh, talk sort of to be a little bit vague about if we're building security or if engineering needs securing or whatever. And it's uh, mostly, I'm just going to talk about who I am, how I got to where I am, and what I've learned along the way. Um, and then I'll try to convince you that uh, security is fundamental to technology. Um, and then a little bit about the future. Um, so I, I grew up in Chicago, and my father likes to tell a story, which is not true, that I learned to read from the, uh, the Sinclair ZX80 basic manual. Um, so I was programming at the age of six. Um, he is lying about that. I learned to read from Cat in the Hat or something. I don't remember. Um, so I actually went to the U of I here, uh, majoring in CS, big surprise. Um, while I was here, I actually interned at Motorola twice. Um, this was interrupted in the middle by me going and spending a little bit of time working at the Beckman AI lab, um, which was fun, but then I went back to Motorola. Um, basically, that whole time uh, from college on, I was playing with Linux and all the free software I could get my hands on. Um, and now I'm working at Google on Chrome OS. But, um, so a little bit about getting from there. My path was a little cir circuitous. Um, but as a first step after, after school, uh, I moved back to Chicago and became a hired gun. I mean, system administrator for hire. I was a consultant um, just doing sysadmin work, sysadmin work on Solaris and AIX. At the time, there was really not much you know, big commercial use of Linux yet. Um, and the pay was amazing after being a student, um, but ultimately I found the work to be uh, pretty dull. Um, but in the meantime, while I was doing things to eat, uh, I played around with a lot of free software and got very involved in, in various projects. Started my own projects where I, uh, you know, found the software deficient. I wanted better control over the, you know, the, the notification systems that I had to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis as a sysadmin. So I wrote software to improve that. Um, and then I was getting into some level of video editing. I had a bunch of MPEG-2 encoders, and I didn't want to have to re-encode stuff. I wanted to do editing on them without encoding. So I wrote video editing software. But all of that intentionally was uh, free software. So Anyone could improve my work, and I could improve their work, and everything would get better over time. Um, ultimately, I sort of got tired of the consulting gig because I didn't feel like I was doing anything um, with, my, with my day job. Uh, so I got sick of that and moved to Portland, Oregon, um, where I got a job working as a sysadmin. <laughs> but this time it was for the open source development lab. Um, this was an all Linux shop, so I didn't have to deal with any proprietary systems. Um, and this was ultimately the organization that became the Linux Foundation. Uh, we hired Linus Torvalds um, while I was still there. Um, I like to say hipster because I was there before it was cool. Uh, <laughs> but um, we hired Lin uh, Linus away because he also had effectively a day job um, that was separate from his work on the Linux kernel. After he got hired at OSDL and continued as a fellow with the Linux Foundation when they changed their name, um, he basically gets to spend all of his time working on Linux now, which was the intent. You know, why should this guy be spending eight hours of his day doing other unrelated things? It makes no sense. 
Um, the fun story I like to tell about this is, of course, we hired Linus, and he worked from his house. He did not, you know, come to, he didn't, at the time, didn't come to Portland. Um, so we'd have, you know, we'd tour the lab uh, with, with people who were showing up to try to, you know, participate in OSDL, and the question we got every time we showed tours was, where is Linus's desk? Like, he's the, he's the reason most of these people are there to, you know, participate in OSDL. Um, and for a long time, we sort of had this disappointing answer, which was, well, he doesn't work here, he works from home, and we'd sort of have to explain all that, and uh, it wasn't a very satisfying answer, so ultimately we made a nameplate, Linus Torvalds, and we stuck it on a cube that we used for storage, and then when people showed up, they'd say, where does Linus Torvalds sit? And we'd go, well, when he's in the office, normally he works at home, he sits in this cube, and this cube is like filled with machinery we don't have any use for, and people are taking pictures of it and everything. It's just, it was pretty cool. Um, while I was at OSDL, um, I started getting involved uh, in a capture the flag contest that was at DEF CON. Uh, if you're not familiar with DEF CON, this is the world's largest computer security conference. Um, that conference is really what you make of it. It is so big, and for many, many, many years, the entire conference to me was the inside of one room like that with everyone sitting around tables typing furiously or more than not staring furiously at their computer. Um, uh, I spent a lot of time on this. We worked very hard. The idea basically with Capture the Flag is to break into the other computer systems that are participating in this thing and defend your own computer systems against all of the other teams who are trying to break into your computers. And um, it's kind of a crazy time. But it, it was a lot of fun. And um, in 2006 and 2007, our team uh, won. Um, after we won in 2006, I had this fear that it was just random. Like, who, you know, oh, we just, it was our turn to win. Um, which, of course, destroyed me for preparing for the next year because I really, really wanted to make sure we could repeat it. And we did, and then I did never want to do it again. <laughs> um, it, was, it was a lot of fun, but uh, after that, started going to DEF CON and sort of seeing everything outside of the CTF room. Um, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. But, um, Anyway, the, the pattern I'm developing here is that there's sort of my day job and a separate thing that I've been doing you know, on the side that interests me a little bit more. Um, but as you can see, they're sort of getting closer and closer. Um, I sort of saw that OSDL was uh, going to start downsizing their staff and sort of focus on you know, providing fellowships for people who need to work on Linux full time and organizing conferences, which is what the Linux Foundation became. So the lab part of OSDL sort of uh, started to evaporate. So I started looking around for what my perfect job would be, um, which at the time I, you know, decided was software security, um, you know, free software security. Um, as it happened, Canonical, who is the corporate uh, sponsors behind Ubuntu, uh, they were hiring, and I said, hey, look, I really love free software. I'm really into security. We just won this CTF thing you should consider me. And they did. They picked me. Um, my job description was hilarious. It was basically, make sure this other guy, Martin Pitt, uh, has no security update work to do. It was my entire job description. Um, I went a little bit further, though, and um, after doing a lot of security updates, you know, you see your, these like weekly updates from Ubuntu about, oh, this has been updated, this has been updated. A lot of that got pretty tedious uh, for me, so I started trying to figure out how how I could make the system more defensive up front. You know, yes, there's a bug in the software, but it is no longer a security bug because of this defense or that defense makes it not exploitable. Um, so I started pulling every piece of you know, proactive security I could, I could find into Ubuntu um, and ultimately built a, te a team of security-minded folks to help me. Um, in the process, I became a Debian developer because Ubuntu is built on top of Debian and it was more efficient to you know, make changes in Debian and have them appear in Ubuntu, so that way it would be in both places, than to do it the other way around. Um, and I started focusing more on the Linux kernel. Um, it kept being the place I would end up looking uh, when I was trying to uh, you know, figure out how to solve a weakness or find the source of a weakness or whatever else. The, the kernel ends up having quite a bit of power over, um, over the system. So solving problems there got, made things easier. Um, so as you can see, my, 
my, my hobby and my job kept getting closer and closer um, uh, in, this, in this state. Um, so while I was perfectly happy working on Ubuntu, um, my work on the kernel caught the attention of some people working on Chrome OS in Google, and Google made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Um, and <laughs> I started working for them. Um, and because of my sort of continuing work on identifying and fixing uh, problems and giving talks about Linux kernel security, um, I'm now actually part of the upstream Linux kernel's security response list. So if you email security at kernel.org and say, oh my god, I saw this horrible bug in your code, what are you people doing? Um, I will at least see it if I don't reply to it. Um, someone else might get to it before me. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of us that um, we sort of try to gather the right people to solve problems and coordinate with other users of Linux, like, oh, hey, here, this is this terrible problem. We want to make it public in like six days, so please prepare yourselves. Here's some fixes, and then once it's public, uh, everyone is fixed. Um, rather than sort of the, the pattern for doing Linux kernel updates was, hey, it's public, and then everyone freaks out and tries to fix it, um, leaving uh, the end user quite vulnerable for a while. Um, I've also become the, uh, the SecComp subsystem maintainer in, in Upstream. Um, so if you're interested in looking at process confinement or reducing kernel attack surfaces, um, that's what SecComp is for, and we should chat afterwards. Um, so my day job now almost entirely overlaps uh, with my Linux kernel work, um, which is pretty great. Um, so what did I learn along the way? Um, I'd say one of my guiding principles is to, um, and I feel like this slide turned into a haiku, and I swear the alliteration wasn't intentional, but uh, I think it's important to fall in love. Um, I discovered free software, and I make the distinction between free software and open source. Open source is, yeah, sure, everyone can use it, and it's nice and all. And free software is, you know, we're all going to make software better, and it is going to resist being controlled. The, the joke between copy left and copy right, you know, it, it makes sure that anyone who modifies it, it stays open. Um, whereas that, that is not strictly true if you uh, are not dealing with, with free software. Um, and I just, I love the idea of free software. Um, we all improve the world. Um, I can't hire someone to fix a bug in Adobe Illustrator but I can hire someone to fix a bug in Inkscape, for example. Um, and I fell in love with artificial intelligence. Um, having computers outsmart me is awesome. Uh, creepy, but awesome. Um, if we're gonna invent Skynet, at least we can try to do the right thing and avoid a robot uprising. Um, I also fell in love in uh, exploiting software security vulnerabilities. Um, it looked like total magic to me. Um, it was an amazing trick to be able to totally redirect software um, to doing something it was never written to do. Um, now, the problem, of course, is that uh, love is challenging. People can get very jaded. Um, I, tried, I tried finding a, a way to illustrate this, and I think the best one was I looked at word frequency counts in the Linux kernel source code. And I developed a, a regular expression for uh, a large number of swear words and all modifications of them. And I got something like, you know, uh, 200 hits on various versions of pretty bad words um, that I didn't put here. Um, as well as, and then another regular expression for, you know, all the various conjugations of love. And it was like three to one. Like, oh, that's depressing. People are spouting all this vitriol and not, they're not talking about love or anything. And I went and looked at all the cases of where, you know, love is mentioned, and depressingly, it was almost all sarcastic. So <laughs> it can't be quite, uh, quite challenging to, to really, you know, keep this wonder alive uh, in things, but um, I, I feel like, at least for me, it was, it was really important to love what I did and the things I was involved in. Um, now, that means also to practice what you love. Um, it may not be so great as a career for you. So I didn't have any real surprises about free software. Um, I love it, I start projects, I help with other projects. Um, it was a, it was a, you know, I had this 
confirmation that I could be successful in that area. Um, it was hard to monetize early on. I had to be patient and creative, but ultimately uh, the world caught up and now I get paid to work on free software. Um, so while I love reading about AI and the results of well-designed AI, um, I appear to be terrible at working on it. Um, all of the hurdles really annoyed me. Um, it, it became pretty, uh, pretty clear quickly that uh, it wasn't gonna be successful for me. I, it wasn't something I, could, I was able to manage to, to contribute to in any way, um, which was disappointing, but I think it was, it was useful that I, I noticed that, you know, like I put up here, that the problems annoyed me instead of energizing me. Like in, at least for me with, with computer security, when I encounter problems, sure there are problems, but I get excited like, oh, this is a challenge to solve, this is great. And whenever I encountered problems in AI, I went, oh, this is awful. <laughs> it, was, it was really frustrating. Um, so I, I was always curious about security vulnerabilities. Uh, and while there was, at the time, uh, very little formal education about it, um, I kept learning and trying things. Um, at my third year at the U of I, I spent two days straight, and probably not on a weekend, uh, in a bathrobe in my basement learning how to exploit um, a buffer overflow in real software. Um, staying enthralled for 48 hours uh, while learning about something was a sure sign that this was something I was gonna enjoy. Um, so if I wasn't clear, uh, explore what fascinates you. Um, maybe you'll turn it into your career. Uh, if not, you'll have something you love that you can do. Um, so when I was at the U of I, uh, I'm sure that there, there were people in the world performing software security engineering, uh, but that really wasn't what it was called. That wasn't their title. Um, and the need for this particular specialization took time before it was wildly, uh, you know, widely recognized by the industry. Um, so, you know, maybe if you find something that you love uh, that doesn't exist or you know, no one will pay you for, uh, maybe you need to be creative. Find someone uh, to, in my case, help, help found, found a company around it. I didn't succeed at that, but um, maybe you will. Um, you know, found a company around doing what you love. Um, there are going to be entirely new careers that no one has really thought of. Um, again, as an example, I tried to come up with something that doesn't exist. How about uh, low altitude navigation and route planning for the coming swarms of package delivery drones? I don't know. No one's teaching that class, I don't think, um, but I'm sure it'll be a real thing. Um, clearly, self-driving cars are cheating by using roads. I mean, this is, this is my approach. Um, so I, I picked some really specific goals for myself early on. Um, they moved around a bit, but uh, I kept edging my career closer and closer to this, you know. I want to be happy, improve the world, and get paid, which that part is really part of the be happy bit, since if I'm starving to death, I'm not too happy about it. Um, so how can I be happy? Well, if I spend all my time working on stuff I love doing, <laughs> there's not much conflict there. That's, that works. Um, it became clear that I had uh, an affinity for finding security vulnerabilities. Um, to me, that was trivially obvious that I should use this skill to make the world a better place. Um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility and all that. Um, and I feel like it's important that if I'm spending eight hours a day or more uh, on software, it would be nice if I could keep using that software even after I leave the given job. Um, and this is a way better to work, a way better way to work um, than putting it on your resume. I mean, you can put it on your resume, but ultimately, um, people can look at what you've done. It's out in the public. Um, they, can, they can see all of my technical skills. They can see all of my social skills. Um, the downside, of course, is that people can also see my lack of either of those two. Um, but I figure I can, show, I can show people that I am improving them uh, over time. And uh, that's, that's much more interesting. If I can go look at all the contributions someone has made in the world in free software, then uh, it, that tells me a lot about them. And that's a lot more information than just reading you know, a page or two of a resume. Um, so you've chosen a career in technology. Uh, 
I want to try and convince you that what you're really working on is actually security. Um, I, I'm grossly oversimplifying this, uh, but as originally used, you know, banking transactions were all managed by people, and we sent physical checks around, and people were looking at them and doing things. That was annoying, so we moved to sort of centralized money management through credit cards and other things. Um, but that was too much at a distance from our banks, so now you know, my phone has banking details on it, and we sort of developed these protocols for automating transactions, and there's fewer and fewer people sort of staring at what's happening. Um, there's a lot of trust placed in these things. Um, it's hard to write common sense into software. Um, as more of our lives are sort of delegated into technology, um, the, the criticality of how, we cor how correctly we design and implement the technology goes up. Um, if you build technology, be it software, hardware, or anything else, uh, doing it safely becomes everyone's responsibility. Um, so I, I think my main point is we have to trust technology, and for it to be trusted, it must be secure. That's trivially obvious. So, and we're becoming more and more responsible for people's lives. Um, two examples I have, which are you know, more obvious, medical equipment, and less obvious, sort of trusted communication channels. Um, and this is where I want to you know, convince you that you need to think about security. Um, so there are plenty of embedded medical devices. Uh, pacemakers have communication protocols over radio channels. Um, usually these things are designed to be, you know, to make diagnostic functions available. Uh, it's obvious that um, anyone using a pacemaker like this is at the mercy of the software in that pacemaker. Um, is that software exploitable? What happens if someone has found out a way to turn it off remotely? Um, if your job is detecting heart arrhythmias and designing a corrective shock patterns um, to send to someone's heart, you might not be thinking about software security. You might be thinking about you know, specifically that, that tiny piece of the whole thing, um, but you should be thinking about security. Have the people designing the radio protocol convince you that it's safe. You know, um, if you think about it, then other people have as well, and, you know, or you need to bring it to their attention. So for trusted communication channels, this, this is an example of uh, a warning that shows up in, in Gmail accounts, um, which I love. I have to read this. Uh, your account could be at risk of state-sponsored attacks. That's a beautiful way of saying that. Um, so if you're providing people with some app or service, um, you have no idea how they might be using it. Um, you know, it, your app might get used by a political dissident in a violent dictatorship and you'll have to be really paranoid about privacy. You know, if not, the people uh, you know, running that app are at a real risk of being killed if they're exposed. I mean, this is an unfortunate reality, um, but if we design software correctly, then we um, don't have to worry about that. So, uh, yes, high responsibility. Um, so here's my terrible analogy, um, the bullet knowledge. Um, so if software vulnerabilities are bullets, then offensive security is a machine gun, and defensive security is body armor. It's a terrible analogy. Um, so I spend my time making technology more secure. Um, I take it as an assumption uh, that this is the right thing to do. Um, that is not the only position people take. Um, if someone understands how bullets work, they can get into the business of designing body armor, if they, or they can get into the business of designing machine guns. To do my job, I must understand security vulnerabilities. Um, with this knowledge, I can either develop exploits for these vulnerabilities, or I can develop fixes for those vulnerabilities. Um, one, by definition, causes harm, and the other protects. So um, there is offensive security. Um, the, this media idea of computer hackers being socially awkward teen vandalizing uh, is seriously outdated. Um, it's uh, in the, in the post-Snowden world, though, I don't have to work too hard to convince people um, that attackers are organized and highly skilled. Um, they're generally criminals, industrial spies, uh, nation states, or some combination of all three. Um, they and the industry around them uh, exist to find vulnerabilities and, exp and exploit their targets, um, but this leaves the rest of the world vulnerable. Um, if you find a way to attack a victim system with a flaw, why do you think they can't do the same to you? 
Um, I have several friends in the offensive security industry. Um, the best way I can summarize their stance uh, is they think that the best defense is a strong offense. Um, I'm personally not willing to accept that though, and I feel like a lot of game theory, psychology, and sociology seems to prove them wrong. Um, also, I may be naive, but I think people are generally good. So this leads us to defensive security. Um, openness helps everyone. There are more people trying to make the world a better place than there are attackers. Um, using cl closed software or trying to obfuscate designs only helps the attackers since reverse engineering is their specialty. Um, using an open design and free software means that everyone can examine the technology and improve it. Not that they always do, uh, but the option exists and that opportunity is what really makes a difference. Um, I sort of have a, a list of things here and this was touched on in the, in the prior talk about quantum computers. Um, please encrypt absolutely everything. If you're doing anything in the clear or storing anything in the clear, um, it's going to hurt you. Um, we need to stay ahead of quantum computers. Um, there is some good news that there are still things that are hard for quantum computers to do. So we're probably gonna see cryptography and other things move more into that realm and away from the easy for quantum computers to solve RSA style stuff. Um, I think this, the, the third bullet on here is assume your technology is going to be attacked and abused. No one is going, there are people who are not gonna use it the way you intended. Um, don't underestimate the attacker. They are extremely well-funded and smart now. Um, use free software and open designs, like I said. Um, try to use safe coding practices. This is you know, more common sense. And the other piece that really falls off, and I hate listing it last because I think it's really important, is actually build tests. You should have more code written for testing than you have code that actually does whatever it is you want to do, for example. Um, this is hugely beneficial, especially when fixing problems, because if you have some des design failure that you have to fix, you need to be able to validate your fix actually works on all the other cases as well. Um, so I think, uh, personally, I think the future is radios. Um, it's an area that people are really not paying a lot of attention to uh, in, in some of the security uh, implications. Um, I already talked about pacemakers. There's all sorts of other embedded medical devices like insulin pumps or whatever. Um, so personal communications is completely obvious. You know, cell phones and laptops and all these other things, they all have radios on them. Um, home and health monitoring, you know, the Fitbit, the Nest, you're gonna heat up your house really high when some attacker attack, I don't know. Um, electric meters are luckily getting some attention, um, state funded attention, which is nice. So, you know, in my city, they just replaced all the electric meters on the outside of the house with uh, devices that create a gigantic citywide mesh network. Um, so now you don't have someone walking from house to house and reading the number and writing it down. They all sort of report everything on their own. Uh, unfortunately, many of these have systems like, hey, turn off that person's electricity. They haven't paid the bill. You know, you can type that command in from somewhere instead of going out and turning off their electricity and going back to the office. So it's much easier to turn off someone's electricity. And of course, this software has bugs in it, so they have an up, a way to update firmware on your electric meter. So what if I update the firmware with firmware that refuses to be updated ever again and turns off everyone's electricity after a certain point? Then suddenly, the entire city now has to have a person go out and fix your electric meter. So there's a lot of, you know, the leverage I was talking earlier with, yes, it's much easier to do your job, electric company, but if you screwed it up, it's going to cost a lot, and there's going to be people with you know, no electricity for days. Um, the vehicular stuff is, is pretty awesome. Um, I've been sort of trying to pay attention to what Tesla Motors has been doing, and they've got you know, radios for everything. The, the key fob, you walk up to the car and it's already unlocked. Well, how do I know my key fob can't be cloned or whatever else? Um, like uh, since 2008, cars are required to have a tire pressure sensor system. Um, these are implemented in varying ways, but ultimately they tend to be radio systems that report from the tire to the car, hey, here's my tire pressure. So, you know, I ask what is stopping me from rolling up next to someone's car and blasting them with a radio signal that says, all of your tires are flat. Or quite the reverse, you let out all the air on all their tires 
and blast them with a radio that says your tires are fine. You know, there's, there's a lot of weird stuff that can go on here. Um, but um, it's my job to think about these terrible things. Um, the Internet of Things, also talked about last time, is, is pretty interesting. I, I'm terrified, personally. Um, they're going to be using all sorts of different communication mediums. Um, I really like the idea of the Internet of Things talking to each other. Um, that is useful, but again, that secure communications is going to be critical. Um, I, I haven't, <coughs> I listed the Fitbit because I have one, but um, I'm still trying to figure out what I can do with that as, as a security thing. And I think uh, probably identity and privacy becomes an issue for Fitbit, but um, I'm not sure anyone can hack my Fitbit and do terrible things to me. They might make the Fitbit useless, but um, I'm still trying to be creative about that one. Um, so ultimately, um, go get your ham radio technician's license. It's, it's, if you know the basics of communication, you can probably pass that test. I did a, a practice test yesterday just to see how I was doing, and without doing any studying, I passed. But um, I think uh, I, should, I should probably actually go do this uh, since I'm recommending it to you as well. Um, there's a fantastic talk this year uh, that was given at, at DEF CON, and uh, she's repeated it a couple times, um, where a... Uh, this woman was uh, very excited to give her presentation by starting with, so I was blow drying my hair, and then a security you know, presentation continued, which was she was using a walkie-talkie while blowing, drying her hair, and was you know, pressing the call button to try and get the other person's attention, and the GFCI circuit in her bathroom tripped. And she went, what in the world is going on here? And ultimately, demoed on stage with this giant Yagi antenna that she can, at a distance, trip GFCI circuits with radio. It's like, okay, I need to actually go get my radio uh, license and start playing with this stuff because it is clearly where the future is. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's sort of it for me. Random brain dump um, for a while. Um, curious if you guys have any thoughts or questions. Be happy to take them. With the Shellshock Bash exploit, and that is an open source project. Is that something that uh, you think needs look at from the open source community? Is that like a flaw of the open source model, or is that just sort of a fluke in the, in the model there? Um, so the question is about the, the Bash Shellshock. Uh, the, the fact that it is open source, is that a, a flaw in, in the model that we had that, or anything else? And um, all software is going to have bugs, and all software is going to have security issues. Um, the good news with that is people all over uh, started looking at that. So you know, the, the upstream authors um, definitely worked to, to solve it, but a lot of new ideas and different solutions came from people who were not necessarily the, you know, the contributing upstream authors. And they actually started coming up with some good ideas for defensive approaches to take to this uh, in the future. So I mean, yeah, it's always you know, egg on any project's face to have these things, but, uh, but I actually think that the model helps in that we look at it and go, oh, okay, well, how should we think about this in the future? How, you know, who can contribute to helping and solving this, this problem? Um, so, you know, uh, I think it's a great example of people contributing and solving a problem better than a very small group could have done on their own with limited time and resources. Anybody else? I'm standing between you and lunch. Cool. Well, thank you very much.